there's a comfort that the people that acted as I did have with standing apart from the crowd. Outsiders. Outsiders. Welcome to Finance in Five. As the saying goes, in a blind world, the one-eyed man is king. In today's video, we're going to be looking at the updated portfolio of Michael Burry's Scion Asset Management based on his latest filings with the SEC. We'll look at his purchases, shares he dumped, his expectations going forward, and two easy ways to invest in order to follow in his footsteps and achieve double-digit returns. Coming up today on Finance in Fact. I'd like to start by saying thank you to everyone who watches these videos. We're now at over 2,000 subscribers, which really seems insane given that this was all just a simple hobby channel. And yet, flocks of intelligent, handsome and fragrant people find themselves subscribing. Now, I am by no means any kind of expert. I was wrong about tailored brands and so was Burry it seems, as we'll talk about. But the degree to which COVID has decimated retail defies precedent. I never expected prolonged pervasive lockdowns of this nature and Burry has spoken out against them on Twitter which you can see in one of my previous videos here. I'm not selling anything and I would urge you to do your own detailed research before investing anywhere so please no one pin your hopes for the future to this or any analysis available on this channel. With all that having been said and with all of your expectations hopefully deflated Gently and lovingly, of course. Once you watch this video, if you give it three or more out of 10, I would be extraordinarily grateful if you could kindly like, subscribe, share, tell everyone you know, and throw several street parties in its honor. Now, the first thing I should point out here, which one of my dedicated, eagle-eyed and knowledgeable viewers was quick to note, is that Burry's most recent SEC filing represents Scion's holdings for the three months ending on the 30th of June, 2020. Therefore, we don't know what, if anything, Burry has done to change his portfolio in the 60 plus days that have elapsed since then, but it's still very useful for all of us humble students of the good doctor. Thank you, good doctor. You, you would think that even if they just <laughs> looked at a sample, maybe they would have come to a realization. Burry's portfolio includes 13 companies he has bought shares in, which are all new, and 16 call options. He has also adjusted his high conviction positions by adding extra shares to some while trimming others. In order to simplify the update, this video subdivides into four sections. One, stocks in new companies. Two, stocks he has kept or added to. Three, stocks he's trimmed back on or dumped altogether. Four, call options. We'll also break down the strategy behind each one. Okay, let's dive in. The first interesting thing to point out here is just how large Scion's portfolio is in terms of the amount of money under management. If you look at this chart, we see that the portfolio value of this hedge fund has jumped from roughly $80 million to $320 million between April and August 2020. We know that Burry also manages assets overseas, and I did a video about his seven Japanese stocks, which you can watch by clicking just here. However, without crunching the numbers, I'm uncertain of the full explanation for this increase in the portfolio size. We know that he's made a ton of profit from various shares in the Scion portfolio, which we will get into. I can't state categorically one way or the other whether new investors have swelled Scion's coffers or whether or not Burry has shifted funds from companies in Asia back into Scion. I know that hedge fund managers need to be nimble and have a global perspective, but I also don't know if he would keep the accounts totally separate to avoid cross-contamination. I know that Americans are taxed on worldwide income, so it probably wouldn't matter exactly where the money was stashed as it would still be subject to US taxes. So section one, stocks in new companies. The nine companies on this top row here are all companies that Bowie recently bought shares in. If we add up all of the money he has invested into these companies, which are circled here, the total comes to just over $54 million. Scion's portfolio is $315 million or so, so shares in new companies comprise 17.34% of the portfolio, so just over one-sixth, which is not actually that big in relative terms. With there being so many companies here, we're going to be hard pushed to do a detailed analysis of all of them. However, we can look at some of the biggest holdings. Bed, Bath and Beyond, for instance. Burry bought 1 million shares in this company at $10.60 per share, which is $10.6 million in total. 
Bed Bath & Beyond is a household name in the US. It operates a chain of retail stores focused primarily on domestic merchandise such as bed linens, bath items, home furnishings, basic housewares and more. The company operates approximately 1,500 stores. In a recent update, it reported an increase in digital sales of 70%, which offset a 15% decline in in-store sales. And this seems to be a broader trend which is unfolding. Online sales displacing domestic or retail store sales. The company saw 2% growth in the second quarter of 2020. Management now, as a result of all of this, is looking at closing 200 stores, which could save as much as $250 million to $300 million a year. Bed Bath & Beyond is now Bury's second largest position behind GameStop. You'll see here that he has boosted his holdings of Discovery Communications and trimmed Quavo and GameStop. But the idea that he's bearish on GameStop can be dismissed. It's still the biggest position in his portfolio in terms of shares that he is long on. And I'm going to be doing another video about the possible GameStop big short squeeze now that Chewy founder Ryan Cohen has just bought up almost 10% of GameStop's shares, which led to a run upwards in the share price yesterday. So you should definitely check out that video when it comes out. I'm going to record it after this one. The other new entrant in the list here is Trip.com. This is a travel service provider based in China and it provides accommodation booking, transportation ticketing, package tours and corporate travel management. Like many other travel stocks, the firm has been battered by the pandemic. However, it seems as if Bury senses an opportunity. It's unclear if this is a bet on the Chinese travel market or the stock in general. Looking at the figures, it's also not easy to see if the stock is undervalued. It's slated to make a loss this year with earnings set to recover in 2021. As there are quite a few sections to cover in the video, I'm just mentioning two more companies Bury has bought shares in, and these relate to oil drilling. They are Precision Drilling and Helmerich and Payne. First, Precision Drilling. We're told that Bury bought 4.024 million shares in this company at a price of 76 cents per share, but I appeal to you guys to let me know how accurate that is, because I think that the 76 cents shown on the 13F suggests that the time of purchase would have been on June the 30th, just by looking at this price history chart, which is when he filed the 13F. But as far as I can tell, I think the imputed share price is just the best guess of whoever put this table together of what he paid for the shares. But it might not be accurate because if he bought them in March, April or May, he would only have paid 30 cents per share or slightly less, in which case he would already have made a big profit. This play may be linked to the oil price decline and the shares, despite doubling since May, have by no means recovered to historic averages since oil's price took a battering early in, in 2020. If we look at the investor presentation from the company's website here, we see that the company drills for oil and lends out equipment to companies who also drill for oil all over the world, but throughout America and Canada. They've constructed more rigs in the Middle East and Kuwait recently. They claim to have boosted market share growth to 8% and have stable cash flow and even improving cash flow. They've also developed this proprietary alpha automation system, which enables drilling to be quicker and to a shallow depth while recovering the comparable deposits by the sound of things. So that will mean less time wasted and fewer man hours thanks to this advanced rig technology. It's a big booster because an increasing number of operators opt for more advanced rigs. So rather than using legacy hydraulic powered rigs, for better efficiency, they use the new type. Apparently with a higher mix of advanced rigs in the fleet, precision drilling will wield more pricing power in the market. Also, not just the rig-based technology. According to PD, its analytics can track and analyze over 10,000 data channels in each rig. As a result, operating costs are expected to go down. So the other thing about precision drilling, which is interesting, is the fact that they're canceling shares, and that's bullish for shareholders. It says here that they are repurchasing and canceling 16 million shares for $26 million. So why is that bullish for shareholders? Well, it's quite simple. Imagine you own 5 million shares in this company and the total float is 50 million shares. So 10% of the company is owned by you. If all of a sudden 25 million of the company's shares are repurchased by the company and canceled, your ownership of the company now jumps from 5 million of 50 million to 5 million of 25 million, which is 20% of the company. So overnight you own twice as much of the company without doing anything. So your returns go up and that's what precision drilling are doing. Pursuant to the renewed issuer bid, the company has been authorized to purchase up to 24 million shares or 10% of the public float as of the 14th of August, 2020 for cancellation. 
Buyback purchases may commence on August 27th, 2020, according to this, and will terminate no later than August 26th, 2021. It's hard to know whether Burry will rotate out of this company as he has others. The documents on their website say that demand for their services is linked fairly tightly to commodity prices, with demand slumping when prices drop and increasing when they rise. This can make it difficult to entice investors or pay off debt. With the latest share buyback program only just beginning, if you buy in now, there may be some insulation from downturns in commodity prices, and this is bullish for the share price. Last of the ones I'm going to cover here, Helmerich and Payne. This is another onshore oil driller, but it's based in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Drilling on onshore American fields has declined the most in 14 years, and that was in April. The financial effect on this company has been really huge. The good news, however, is that the company doesn't really have any debt, according to this chart. And we can also see the range of revenue sources that they use to generate their cash flow. On the plus side, the market has found some low support and oil prices have recovered enough to allow survival pace. The bad news, however, is that oil demand will likely stay anemic for many quarters due to the coronavirus pandemic and the fact that international travel will remain subdued, at least until the possible rollout of the solution under discussion here, which is in no way about control. What could possibly go wrong? Section 2. Stocks Burry has kept or added to. Discovery Communications. As I mentioned, he has boosted his holdings in Discovery Company. As of today, its share price is $22. The price has been fairly choppy, but Burry sees no problem adding to his position. How much in total? $1.3 billion. What? That's, that's pretty much all of Scion's liquidity. Michael, this is highly distressing. According to some analysts, advertising revenue is recovering fairly quickly and the company's paying off its long-term debt sustainably. Discovery could eventually be looking to sell itself to a larger competitor. So that's perhaps why he's bolstered his position. Moving on quickly to section three, these are companies which Burry has trimmed his positions in or got rid of completely. But I realize my error here because technically speaking, if he has trimmed shares in these companies, then he still retains ownership of them, which means that section three companies also meet the description given in section two, meaning I have created two distinct categories for explanatory purposes and then failed miserably to actually understand what either of them means. Very much as though I have learning difficulties. So please bear with me here while I wipe the vomit from my forehead and then we'll continue. So, because I've been looking inside myself and struggling to care about Section 3, I've put together a table here which shows the companies that Burry has sold or trimmed back on. These are all estimates, so they have all the accuracy that you would expect from a stranger who spends his life stalking famous investors in the vain hope that IQ points can be absorbed as a result of reading 13F filings. We see here that he completely sold his positions in Boeing, Facebook, Jack in the Box and Michaels, and sold some of Corvo and Maxar while keeping the rest. In every case, these are estimates of the profits taken, because 13F filings don't show the exact date of sale. However, the stock prices have risen fairly dramatically in all cases since early April. By my reckoning, despite the loss sustained when Taylor Brands crashed and he liquidated his position, he has made around $48 million in profit from these companies, from initial capital of $72 million, which is about 40% profit. And don't forget, that's not APR, that's just in one quarter, folks. But let's say I'm wrong with these estimates. You might say my numbers are out with the Taylor brand sale or that he made less from Michaels or whatever the case may be. Okay, fine. Let's imagine I'm wrong and he made less profit, let's say half. His yield still exceeds an 80% annual percentage return just on these stocks. That's completely insane, especially when you consider how many billions the likes of Buffett and Dalio lost during this crisis. This is why the actions of Burry should get your attention. We went through the Great Depression, world wars, all kinds of things, and this country just keeps chugging forward. None of us are likely to be hedge fund managers, but if we just take one or two of these ideas of his and run with them, maybe that's all we need to do. So the two easy ways to invest that I mentioned at the start of the video, download an app such as 212 or M1 Finance or Webull and set up automatic investments so that you're purchasing a small portion of shares on a regular and uninterrupted basis on the same day each month between now and say next March. Cutting edge high tech firm out of the Midwest awaiting imminent 
patent approval on a next generation of radar detectors. The two that you should purchase, in my humble opinion, based on what we've been talking about and based on every technical factor out there. Based on every technical factor out there, John, we are looking at a grand slam home run. Our GameStop and Discovery A. 4,000, that'd be 40,000 shares, John. Let me lock in that trade right now and get back to you with my secretary with an exact confirmation. Sound good, John? Great. I've demonstrated Boris' credentials here as far as securing returns for Scion investors. And these are two companies that he has millions of shares in. They're both trading below intrinsic value even now. And the fact that Boris and many other hedge fund managers are long on these companies is a bullish sign. Section four, call options. Burry bought 80,000 call options in Alphabet with notional value of $113 million. If you add up all of the value of all of the call options that Burry has purchased here, it comes to $216,374,000, which comprises 68.9% of Burry's entire portfolio. It means that he's more of a trader than an investor because he's betting on the price to go up. Alphabet is a mega cap tech company. Google very well may be the most dominant search engine or web advertising or interactive media company in the world. It has dynamite in its YouTube and cloud businesses and that doesn't even consider the potential from Alphabet's Waymo autonomous vehicle business. It's a wide moat corporate entity, if ever there was one, whose balance sheet retains $120 billion in cash. So what is so special about these call options? A call option essentially is an agreement to buy shares under certain conditions. Let's say that you think that shares in a company are going to go up in price. They're worth $1 now, but you expect them to be worth $10 in a year. You might open up a call option in which you agree in, say, 12 months' time to buy 1,000 shares for $2 per share. The $2 value is called the strike price. Since you think that by that time the shares each will be worth $10, you'd be buying each share at an $8 discount. Then you could sell them back to the market straight away, netting you $8 per share in the process. You have to pay premiums for holding call options, and these need to be deducted from any profit that you make. Unlike owning the shares outright, there is a risk that you could lose money if the shares go down rather than up, or that the call option could expire worthless if you don't sell it before the contract end date. Burry took out a call option on Alphabet, Google's parent company, and while we don't know what the premiums were, what the strike price was, what the end date was, or what the profit was, we do know that Alphabet recovered most of its losses and has been on an upward trajectory since March. The same applies to the other companies Burry took out call options on, such as Facebook, Goldman, Cracker Barrel, Wynn Resorts, Las Vegas Sands, Foot Locker, JP Morgan, Booking Holdings, Viacom, Western Digital, Bank of America, National Oil Well, Waco, Quavo, and all of them. It's interesting to think that he's taken out such an enormous leverage bet just on call options as opposed to the strategy of holding shares long term. It's not necessarily as opposed to, it's more in conjunction with, but call options appear to be the most significant portion of Burry's portfolio. It's the thing that he is leveraging in this difficult time. He is leveraging the crisis. I don't mean exploiting it, he's just noticing that the initial reaction to the pandemic was such as to distort the markets in favor of immediate or short-term losses and now he was betting on a recovery and he may still be betting on further recovery so that's it for now i hope that you enjoyed this video i'm sorry that i can't go into more detail on every company it just takes too much time i will be doing follow-up videos based loosely around some of the topics that we've discussed today thank you very much for watching and if you enjoy the video please like and subscribe best wishes